Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the planning part of the authority meeting. Um, the um, agenda moves straight into development management. And the first item that we have to consider this afternoon is 13.1, application 6241-21024. And this is the proposed demolition of the existing former care home and erection of nine dwelling houses at Lydiate Lodge, Rock Lodge Park, Linton. This is going to be presented by Mr. Jones. Thank you, Chair, uh, members. So uh, this planning application is for uh, the demolition of an existing former care home and construction of nine dwellings. It's three affordable and nine and uh, six principal residents. Uh, the, the recommendation is approval with conditions under six, section 106 agreement. Um, and the reason for bringing it before committee is uh, in accordance with the scheme of delegation. Uh, the officer recommendation is approval, which is contrary to the town council view, uh, which is an objection. So this shows the site location. It's the, the southwest side of um, of uh, Linton, near the bowls club, tennis court, and, and, and some recreation land. So looking in closer, that's the existing former care home. Um, the site's about 0.23 hectares, that's half an acre, previously developed land um, occupied by a large building. Uh, so it's a disused building with landscape area um, to the, uh, the, the north and west, southwest, and parking here, the access road here. That's the plan there. So for, for reference later, I mean, no, there's uh, the terrace-style housing in the vicinity. Again, this is the existing plan view. Uh, we have a small river and stream to the north, and there's a public footpath. Uh, landscaping on either on, on the north and west and south. There's U House here and Rock Lodge here, um, properties that I'll, I'll refer to later, um, other housing lower here, and a, a row of bungalows here on, on land rising towards the south, also serve from Rock Lodge Park. Rock Lodge here is a Grade 2 listed building. This is the proposed layout. So the proposal is to, to demolish this building here that's shown with the red outline. So it's a similar sort of footprint. We have um, plots one and two here. I'll come to this more later. Plot one is split into two sort of maisonettes. Two uh, is a two bedroom property. These two, th these three are affordable houses. And then plots four to nine, these are kind of uh, linked and terrace. These two are uh, semi-detached, but the, the overall uh, appearance is, a, is of a terrace. So four to nine would be, um, if permitted, principal residence. Um, the distance, again, I'll, I'll come into detail on this later, the distance from New House here, uh, and this notably is, is an upstairs sort of sitting, it's kind of an upside down house, where the sitting area and, and, and dining and kitchen are here, and that's about 19 metres from that um, balcony to the to the, the closest bit of the, the proposed redevelopment. So there's two parking spaces proposed for each property, so there's there's eighteen in total. That's the elevation of the existing building. I think it runs at about 161 
um, Mises High. Uh, and important to note this because it, it's relevant to the the, the um, points I'll uh, um, go into more detail later. So that, but if you note, the, the roof runs at a, a constant height across the site. So this is the view from um, just off of the main road in, in Linton. So I think that's Crossmead and Longmead. Looking southwards or southeastwards towards, that's the existing building there. Um, that's the listed building there, U, um, Rock Lodge, and that's U House. This is looking from the uh, this is the tennis courts. I think we're, we're just in front of the bowling club, so that's looking southwards. The existing building to be demolished. These properties are retained. Um, U Tree House Rock Lodge. This is on the access road looking west with U Tree House there, Rock Lodge there. These buildings are retained. This will be demolished. This is from Lydia Lane. So that's to the sort of northeast looking. And so here's the properties again listed building, residential property, buildings can be demolished, recreational ground. And this is looking for this is the access road looking at sort of west, northwest. Again, here's the property to be demolished and where the, the new houses will be built. And then that's just further up the road looking in a more westerly direction. This is the layout for the uh, plots one, two, and three. These are the affordable housing plots. I'll look at I'll look at those more carefully, uh, closely later to, to um, look at the detailed layout if, if members want to do that. But I will talk about the the size of those later. Um, so you can see the style is is drawing on other housing in the area with with um, sort of balcony uh, bay windows, um, traditional materials, slate roof, um, wooden windows. Um, the, there's brick used. Um, weatherboarding, so I say natural slate roof. In the report, I said black UPVC gutters. It's actually black powder coated metal. So um, we we'll check that with the the applicant. That is what they proposed. So it was an error in the report. Apologies. Um, these materials will be conditioned as part of the plans, and of course specifically um, as these materials are important that um, they are used in 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 a sensitive setting. Um, the gross internal floor area of the affordable dwellings are there's a two bed at 65 square meters and two one beds at 38 and 40. So these meet the national described space standards. One bed's 37 meters squared, two beds is 61. So um, they are they meet the standards. I think this is um. Maybe slightly out of order, but I'm going to go with my notes. So I want to make sure I cover everything and not confuse myself, not least yourselves. Um, I'll come back to design in a moment, but I wanted to address uh, as a local plan requirement, obviously for all new residential development to contribute towards creation of sustainable, balanced, inclusive uh, communities, ensure an appropriate mix of dwellings. So we. The, the neighbourhood plan and um, Devon Home Choice and Survey has consistently shown that, that there's an identified need of more than 20. At, at times it's been up to 32. It could be more. These things are never exact and precise, but there's clearly, um, I don't need to tell you, an, an acute demand for affordable. Um, so the application proposes three affordable housing units. So the, the, the two one beds would be social rent and the, the two bed would be affordable rent. Um, the applicant submitted a viability study, um, which we have, uh, officers have, with the help of um, DCH. I just can't remember if I open the. Um, I'll try and what DCH stood for. <laughs> the, 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 the consultants have done a, a, you know, an independent assessment of the, um, the viability assessment and it demonstrates that an, 
the applicant wouldn't be making an unreasonable profit. And indeed, when they were proposing just two affordable units, that, that was still within the realms of being uh, a reasonable profit. Um, but if you note um, North Devon uh, Council uh, housing uh, response refers to th th this viability review in Appendix 4 uh, looked at an alternative layout um, that might yield more affordable housing. So following that, we have had uh, extensive negotiations with the applicant um, and we now have three affordable units um, and officers are, are, are satisfied that the proposals are a fair and reasonable solution to the redevelopment of the site, accepting that the developer can make a reasonable profit. Um, having social rent, which are the most acutely needed uh, properties, um, it, it, it reflects um, this um, as part of that um, discussion with the, with the applicant. So the tenure occupancy and management of the properties will be the subject of a, a Section 106 legal agreement if uh, permission were granted. So I'll now return to the design. So if you recall, this is plots four, five, six, and seven. So we had two um, semi-detached at the, at the northern end. Uh, and the, these are similar style three bedroom properties with, with three story properties with um, uh, using the loft space for bedrooms, uh, same design um, features, um, solar panels, and they're the layouts of the, you know, the plan view of, of the various uh, floors. And these are plots eight and nine. These are the um, detached dwellings on, on the northern end. Same design style. So a key issue um, in um, interrogating the, the, the design to see if it's suitable for location, um, clearly uh, the, the, the material, the, the form, the mass, the materials, um, the, our um, heritage officer considers that these are appropriate and, and respect the setting of Rock Lodge. Um, my view is that in a, the removal of a what was an incongruous building and replacement with this more traditional terrace style is, is an improvement of the setting. Um, my personal view as a planning officer, um, but I'm trying to see, I don't think you'll be able to see the, the, the heights there, uh, but I'll try and... Um, is it possible to... Oops, I didn't want that to happen. I don't know whether I can zoom in, but I'll just have to talk you through it. This, so this is the... The existing building is 161.4, I think, metres high. Uh, here, so that's the east end. Uh, these are the, the affordable properties there up to about 164. And they drop down in the terrace as the land drops down towards the footpath. Um, and we have these two properties here that are the closest. To, this is U Tree House there, and, and that's kind of the living area with a balcony there. That's 19 metres away. The... Um, the windows at the rear will be non-opening and obscured. Um, so I, I, I don't, my view is that it's not intrusive, but uh, I'll show you some um, photographs in a moment. And I, I think Dean has a, has a letter to read from, from the resident. We'll go into that in a second. Um, but my, I, I visited this site and I, I sat with the, the owner there and recognised there is an impact on their view. Um, as you're aware, we, you know, we, we don't have a right to a view in planning, but um, and, and also... <laughs> I guess to an extent it's experienced subjectively, the, 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 the owners of the property consider it had a, a, an adverse impact on them. It has an impact. Um, the, not only did the applicant um, move the properties a little bit further away by about three metres, there are pitched roofs that break up the, 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 the impact. Um, and it, it, in the last couple of weeks, um, following my visit, I asked whether they could lower the height of that, and they've lowered the finished floor level by, as a correction in the report, I'd put 340 centimetres. Um, that's a, a, an error that would have been quite significant. So apologies for that. It's actually 370 millimetres. So it is lower. Um, and, and I think in all respects, the, the, the applicants work positively with us to, to get a, a, a good design. There is an impact on that property. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um,
this shows uh, we, we have a landscape plan here. So this is the, you know, the, the hard servicing with parking. There's landscaping there. We've worked again with the informed by the ecology reports and working with the applicant. Um, there was a, an earlier design that had a property here. Um, we thought felt that was too cramped and compromised the parking. Again, the applicant has, has, has worked with us there positively to, to get a much better form there where the, the flow of vehicles will be a, a, a lot safer and, and simple. Um, I think there's an area of, of grass creek here and we've got some planting at the rear, extensive planting. Um, I'll come on to ecology benefits in a bit, but there's several features within there. So um, this landscaping plan would be conditioned um, if permission were granted. This is the um, scheme management plan. I'll have to refer to my notes to make sure it's so that the, the proposal is the affordable units will be sold freehold to an affordable housing provider. Um, other units will be subject to principal residence. Communal parking, turning yard would remain private, owned by a management company. Um, and this would all be um, wrapped up in, a, in part of the Section 106 legal agreement. They would also, uh, and the management company will also manage the private road, communal paths, recycling, waste storage, and, and surface water drainage. So, Dean, this is the point I want to look at. Um, this, this is the view from the balcony at U Tree House. So, do you want to? Okay, sorry, Dean. I can go back to the drawings if you want, want to be reminded, but um, that's the form of the. If you remember, they've got the. This is the existing building. Plots eight and nine would be here, and they would be about two meters higher. So this is at the edge of the sitting area. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm presenting the worst case scenario there. Obviously, you're going to have a, a building with pitched roofs here, which would um, take away some of that view. My view is it's not intrusive, and there'd be obscured windows at the rear. That's a view looking east. Again, this is the existing building, and you would have pitched roofs here across the site, um, increasing in height. And this is the view from the garden. This is up by the hedgerow, and you can see the existing building there. So it'd be slightly, it'd be two meters higher than that. So about again, something like that. Just wanted to show you the layouts for the um, affordable properties. Um, they meet. This, this is the ground floor. So the entrance to plot one, plot and, and unit two. And the first floor, we have the upstairs unit one with the bedroom and study. Um, and the ups this is uh, plot three coming in here. And then two bedrooms in, in the roof space for that uh, affordable rent property. Final point, I'll just check that is my final point. I regret saying that, probably my penultimate point. Um, so this is the um, highway. This is Lydiate Lane. It goes on, up, up. You might, it, you know, goes uphill from here and then it, coming towards us from the back, back of me is, goes into Linton. So this is the access. And then turn right or from up here and turn left. It, his, uh, the, the properties would be down here. So the, the Highway Authority hasn't commented um, they did comment. They have commented on a previous application, um, and, and with more uh, units, they were satisfied it didn't compromise safety. Um, Recognising that, uh, that, that you know the roads are what they are, uh, you know the, the historic narrow lanes, um, but bearing in mind that the highway authority hasn't raised a concern previously or on this occasion on highway safety, I think thinking about the wording of the MPPF, uh, there's not a severe impact, so there wouldn't be a reason to refuse planning application, uh, albeit it's, it, it, you know, if you're redesigning it now, it might not be as it is. So that's the end of my presentation. I think Dean wanted to read out a, a, a letter from a, from a neighbour. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. We've got um, two public speakers, and uh, we've also got a letter from a local resident, um, Mr. and Mrs. Thorne, and Mr. Kinsella is going to begin by reading their statement. Unfortunately, they can't attend, so they've sent a written statement which will now be read. So this is a statement on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Thorpe. Uh, U House was granted planning permission to be built about 20 years ago, taking advantage of the views without affecting any other property. It is a major attraction of our home. This would be destroyed if the application as currently envisaged is accepted. Imagine the new buildings would be the equivalent in height to people standing on the roof of the current building and would seriously detract from all aspects of our home and garden. The views were also the major driver of the price that we paid for the property. Common sense suggests that we are likely to see a significant fall in the price we are likely to get if we find that we cannot tolerate the consequences of the proposals and decide to move. Although the small reduction in height, 370 millimetres, of the proposed dwellings numbers 8 and 9 would be a slight improvement, there is no change to dwelling numbers 6 and 7. The overall impact on U House would still be significant. If the new buildings were no higher than the existing building, we would have no objection. We hope that you can understand from the photographs taken from our balcony how devastating it would be if the proposed development were to be approved. We urge you to reject this plan. Thank you very much. Um, we have two further speakers, the first of whom is Mr King. If you would like to speak, Mr. King, you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. Um, if you could come forward to the microphone, please. And can you just make sure that it is turned on at the top? Okay. So you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. Sorry, good afternoon. Um, my interest in this is an interest in affordable housing. Uh, my view is that the, the whole development should be uh, affordable housing let for rent in per perpetuity. Uh, and uh, my view is also that the uh, financial feasibility assessment done earlier on this application was not perhaps as good as it should have been. Uh, I live in Linton. I live in a, a, built, a home that is uh, 85 metres square. Uh, I had a valuation done on the house about the same time as the, the original feasibility study on this. Uh, the, the value of that was 320,000 300, yeah, 320, at the time. Um, since then, it's gone up by at least 30%. Uh, the price put on the houses in the applicant's feasibility study, which is now removed from the from the application, was 240 to 265,000. So that was 25% lower than the my valuation on my home, which was uh, of a lower standard than these are going to be. And now, in my view, the valuation of these homes is going to be uh, at least 60% higher than the 240 to 265 they put on at the time of application. So my view on that is, at the very least, uh, they, you know, the development, if it can't be all affordable housing, then there should be more units of uh, social housing or rental housing that is rented in perpetuity. And my only concern, or my other concern, is I know what happens in developments. In, if the houses can't be sold at market price, at the for rental, then they're sold in the open market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. King. And our final speaker is Mr. Woodward, who is the agent. Again, Mr. Woodward, you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. If you could just check that the microphone is on. I think it is. Good okay. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Uh, John Woodward, agent for the applicant. Um, Right, uh, just a couple of quick things. The plots six and seven are off to the side of the view off the balcony, is the first comment I'd make. And just looking at the levels, I just did a quick check, and it's actually a rise of 1.12 metres 
above the existing roof level, not two metres. Okay, so it's not a man standing on the roof. So that's dealing with those items. Obviously, sorry, uh, also in terms of the rise in uh, prices of property we've seen, we've also seen a uh, corresponding rise in the, pro uh, in the cost of materials and just developing generally. So I would argue that the viability still stands. Brief history, um, the care home closed in 2015, Devon County Council deemed it unviable to run. Uh, it was offered to the community as a community asset, but no offers were made on the building. The applicant, uh, who is the applicant today, bought the property in 2016 and originally conceived of a scheme of 15 flats. That scheme was refused in 2018. I was engaged in 2019 to rethink the opportunities and my focus fell on creating a gabled terrace of villas that would reference the Victorian heritage address the public park to the front while respecting the setting and amenity of Rock Lodge and U House itself. Initial proposals were subject to extended pre-planning uh, discussions and followed a public consultation exercise in July 2020. The scheme has been amended during the determination period and we arrived today with an officer recommendation of approval for a scheme of nine principal residence homes 30% of which are affordable. A quick word on the viability. Um, your planning officer touched on this. I want to make it clear that the comment made in the agenda by Jamie Jays of North Devon District Council um, is with relation to an alternative scheme. It is not in relation to this scheme. It was a different scheme comprising a different mix and a different number of homes. The viability for this scheme of nine homes is fully tested and the agreement has been reached that 30% affordable is viable and deliverable even though the level of profit is less than the 20% in government guidance. I'm proud of this scheme and I encourage you to approve it today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Woodward. Right, we now move to member debate. Uh, the first member to catch my eye was Mr. Petrinos. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> I've got um, three points, but, but first, really, I've got a question about the process, the, the, um, application, the advertising process for the application. Um, it seemed, when I was reading through the responses to the consultation responses, that some people were responding to what the agent has just described as an alternative scheme, um, as opposed to the scheme that we're considering today. I just didn't quite understand whether, if that is an alternative scheme, there should have been a separate process of consultation gone through for this scheme. Sure, thank you. So um, there has only been one proposed scheme. It has been amended. Um, that there was um, an additional property here, uh, but when that was amended, there was a second consultation. So the the reference to an alternative scheme was um, Exmoor National Park. As, as officers, we uh, commissioned a review of the applicant's viability study, and in that, it it, it made a judgment on the proposed scheme. It also suggested in appendix for that document that there could be a different way of de delivering units on the site. So this was purely in, in the viability assessment was um, testing the idea that, that there could be smaller units across the board and, and that that might um, deliver a, a different mix of, of affordable and principal residence housing. So that wasn't a consultation, um, that was a, 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 a test as part of the viability study and the, and the review of the viability study, but it wasn't ever a, a, a proposed development because the, um, how this has worked obviously is that the applicants put forward a proposed development. Um, as offices, we've we've asked them to amend it, and they have. That's been uh, there was a second consultation. Does that all make sense? Is that clear? So, Fred, no, sorry, I don't know. So I'll try it again. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. With less detail, there was there was a planning application yeah. submitted, um, and it has been amended and reconsulted on that. But the, no, the amendment was minor 
compared to the overall. An alternative scheme was tested in a viability assessment, just theoretical, what if we did it in a different way with smaller units? So that was purely in a viability assessment by the, um, the consultant that was testing viability. It will be in relation to the um, amended scheme, not an alternative. There's only been one planning application. Yes. Right. You said. Um, my three points. First off, highways. I mean, I was disappointed that there was no highways response to this scheme because um, I know you've referred to a highways response on a different scheme at a different time, but I'm, I'm the, the sort of thread that runs through these is that each, and each application is um, separate unto itself, so it, you can't really read from one to the next is what I thought. And in addition, this, the access to this scheme is at the bottom of a steep hill on, on a very sharp turn, which I know there has been accidents on. In fact, I can remember a coach going through the stone wall there and sort of lying at 45 degrees. Uh, so I was qu quite surprised that the highways didn't have something rather to say, even if it was well, whatever it was. Uh, my main concern, though, is about the, um, the balance in these, this proposal between open market um, primary residence accommodation and social or affordable. Now, I know that the local plan calls for a, a contribution towards a balanced community, but the, uh, we've heard of, and we all know about how the housing crisis is, is striking the whole country, but it, it seems that in this area, certainly, the community has already become unbalanced in that Many businesses are closing early or closing for some days of the week. Shops are closing early because they can't get staff. Not because there are fewer staff, but in addition, because people cannot afford to live in Linton because there is no affordable accommodation. Now, at the moment, the uh, two out of the nine properties would are a social rent, which would be great, and one, one affordable. Um, but the others aren't, and it seems that to me that the balance between two thirds being open market and one third being affordable is the wrong way around. Um, so I'm kind of surprised at that, particularly as during the agent's um, presentation. I mean, the two the two speakers at the beginning of this, we had one say that they thought that in the viability assessment, the value of the properties the sale of the properties was artificially low. And then we had the agent say that the cost of constructing them was wrong as well. It strikes me that if all the figures in the viability assessment were wrong, that we shouldn't be accepting um, a scheme based upon that viability assessment. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to propose that we refuse this, we re refuse the application um, because it conflicts with policy HCS2 requiring a balanced, affordable, a balanced, sustainable, inclusive community. Thanks. Okay. Um, I wonder if I could just ask uh, Mr. Kinsella or Mr. Jones to comment on that before I move any further, please. Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just to... Um, clarify, I, I think the point that was being made by the agent was that um, I think that the first speaker made reference to the fact that there was uh, local house prices and they had been valued at a certain level and that when you take into account the significant increase in house values over the last 12 months, say, that that, that would inflate those values even more. And the concern was that the, the current proposals as before you were being undervalued because of that. 
And the agent was making the point that, but alongside that increase in value, there was an increase in the build costs associated with the development. Um, and so, therefore, um, they almost balanced themselves out. Now, with any um, application um, uh, of this nature, um, there is a, a viability assessment that's requested, which the applicant will um, submit. And then there will be a uh, further consultant who is uh, instructed by the planning authority to, to test that. And that's where a little bit of the confusion earlier on, I think, came in terms of this alternative scheme that people keep on referring to that hasn't been consulted on. It's because of, as part of that test exercise, that we would expect consultants to sort of say, well, okay, this might be what you can achieve with this scheme, but if you factor in all the build costs and values on a slightly different scheme, that might give you a different outcome. And I think that's probably where that, that's come from a little bit, but was never formed part of a, of a scheme um, that, that, is, that is before us. Um, so um, all I can say in conclusion is that um, two professional uh, viability uh, consultants consultees have have put forward their their views on the viability of this site one instructed by the applicant one instructed by the local planning authority there has been extensive negotiations and it is felt that the current mix is is as um, viable as the scheme can make it so while we would all want uh, hundred percent affordable uh, housing within the development um, that isn't always achievable and the planning system does allow for that uh, cross subsidy as does the local planning policies. Thank you. Um, nevertheless, refusal has been moved by Mr. Petrinos um, and I believe that he wishes to stick with that even in the light of the planning officer's comments. He's put forward a planning reason. Um, it, is anyone uh, prepared to second that uh, refusal at this stage? If not, we'll continue with the debate. Any member wish to speak? Dr. Kelly. Yes, Chair. Uh, it, it's a confusing picture, um, admittedly. Um, it seems to me that there, there probably is an alternative scheme for the site that would deliver an additional number of affordable homes. But that isn't before us today. And we're being told that it has been tested. I'm not absolutely certain about that because there have been changes recently. We've noted those changes in terms of values and cost of buildings. So I'm, I'm not particularly happy that we are totally comfortable with the information we have on the viability side. There is an alternative scheme that will deliver more affordable homes, I'm sure. And if you look at the, um, the Housing and Neighbouring Officer's comments uh, on page three of the agenda report, she says the main driver should be affordable housing, which is, of course, what the Exmoor National Park uh, local plan is saying. But nonetheless, we've got what we've got before us, so we need to be comfortable uh, that we are able to approve this application. It's also another point Linton Town Council have recommended refusal of the application. They're not, they're not convinced about the 10-year mix. And going back to Councillor Petrinus' point, they also refer to the access difficulties. And it is very disappointing that we don't have the Highway Authority's comments on this application. It's a major application in the context of Linton. It's almost a major application in terms of national standards. So it is very disappointing that we haven't had any comments from the Highway Authority. And that, I think, is almost a matter uh, to defer this application. We may be well deferring it on other grounds, uh, but I don't feel comfortable about making a decision in the absence of any such response from the Highway Authority. Um, the point about the impact on a particular dwelling, it's a difficult one because there is no doubt in my view, uh, sorry, I didn't mean that, there is no doubt uh, that this will have a profound impact on the quality of uh, life experienced by the occupants of that particular dwelling. But if we try and disaggregate that reasoning into, well, is it going to impact on a view because a view isn't a material planning consideration? Is it going to impact on the value of my property because that's, that's not a material consideration? Well, we are entitled to ignore that. But nonetheless, 
it's very clear, isn't it, from the photographs, we've not seen it on site, uh, that it's going to have a profound impact in terms of the experience of occupants of that property. So I'm not suggesting uh, that we refuse the application, but I'm not comfortable about arriving at a decision this afternoon. Thanks, Chair. Dr. Kelly, do you want to comment on that at this stage? Mr. Kinsella? No, thank you. Um, Mrs. Lawrence? Yeah, very interesting, this. Uh, I'm really pleased that somebody's come up with a, a plan to use this piece of land because obviously it's been empty for quite a few years already, and I'm pleased that this has come forward. Obviously, I would love it if there was far more affordable houses in the mix. Of course, we all would. But timing is everything, and my feeling is a bit worrying because if we don't move now, the finances of the future might be even worse, and that might even be harder to get. We've got three affordable houses, so three families can ben benefit from living here. Um, so it isn't perfect by any means. Seldom perfect can be found. But I don't want to miss the opportunity because in three or four years' time, we might be in a worse state than we are now and not able perhaps even to do what we're doing here. So I am really thinking hard about this. My query was, and there is, uh, there was two car parking spaces per house, which I think absolutely essential. Um, but then there was some sort of, would it be their car parking spaces or would they just be available car parking spaces? I think that needs a bit more clarity. I didn't quite catch what the gentleman was saying. It's going to be a, looked after by somebody or whatever. He was. I need a bit more. I want those two places per house to be them for one house, definitely, and free, not paid for or whatever. I just don't want people to be thinking that they're getting somewhere to park their car when clearly they're not. So I just need a bit more clarification. But reluctant though I am because of the numbering, I do feel this is an opportunity to move forward, whereas in the future we might regret that we haven't. Right. Thank you, Mrs. Lawrence. Mr. Ellicott. Well, a lot has been made of the fact that the affordable family accommodation um, I don't think a property of the size that two of the units are are family accommodation. Um, they're so small. If it was one of the other houses, one of the other properties that were the affordable, I think it would be more acceptable. I'd, I'd be interested to see what percentage, I know it's three properties out of nine, that they've got down is technically affordable. But I wonder how it works out on the footage, the, squ or the square footage of the properties. If you added up all the properties' footage and then um, from the three affordable and the other six, how that would work out. Because I, I can't see um, the three affordable or at least two of them anyway, being what you could call family accommodation. And in the in the notes that we were given, they were saying about how many children it would bring to the village, um, the village school and everything else. Those properties are so small, I don't think it would bring a lot of families into the property, in, into the uh, development. Right, thank you, Mr. Ellicott. Mr. Lay. Yes, thanks. Um, it, it appears to me this issue of viability and the outcome of it, how many affordable units it produces, is the key to, to what we're talking about here. Um, there are minor, other minor issues, but I've been seeing quite a number of these types of schemes come forward, you know, many of them much bigger than this. One thing that's an absolute fact, if you come eventually to an appeal situation, I've not yet seen an appeal inspector. They always go by what the independent viability assessment concludes. What are your own personal opinion is, whether that's right or wrong. So I'm going to ask 
Dean a little bit more detail about this independent assessment, if I may. You know, um, it's obviously we don't see it, but can you summarise you know, it, it, its conclusions and why they've uh, arrived at this this figure? Because it, it, uh, they're pretty much uh, agreeing with the um, applicant's assessment. I understand. C can you just enlighten a little little bit? More? Next question from Mrs. Nicholson, and then come back to Mr. Kinsella, if that's all right, Mr. Lay. I've got a minor. That's fine. You be put the, your next point as well. I'll take Mrs. Nicholson, and then we'll have um, Mr. Kinsella. No, the minor thing I was going to ask for, I guess, to be clarified, is this reference um, to do with window doors, gutterings, etc., etc. Yeah, I think it's page 31 that we have. It's listed that. All three uh, types of material will have an equal crack of the whip. Windows, windows, uh, windows, windows, aluminium, um, uh, weather, weather boards, um, and then there's a certain element of PVC. That's on page 31. But the conclude in the at the end in the I think it's the last um, uh, number 11. In, in the uh, um, conditions, that doesn't comply with what it says in the report earlier. Uh, what, what it says in the report on page 31, those two are not consistent. Just clarification on that. But it's that first point, to me, is the crucial one. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mrs Nicholson. Right, thank, you very much. thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, first of all, I, I just want to echo Chris um, Chris Lawrence on the question of, of we may need to be thankful for what we can get. Um, I would add to that that we have in the park housing need, housing need for homes and that is not only affordable or social rent. Um, so we are not building second homes here or holiday let if we, if we let this go through. So I, I think that, that, that uh, that's something we need to keep in mind. The other thing we need to keep in mind is that our greatest need is for housing for single people, and affordable housing is, is, uh, need is for single people. So I welcome the fact that we've got some really small ones, and it's going to be grim if more people are squashed in, and we know how difficult that will be. We hope that, however, it will meet a need which undoubtedly exists for single people. Um, the other things, um, yes, viability is a really difficult thing. It's a bit like saying how long's a piece of string. Um, we have to take the advice that we're given. Um, and the only other thing I want to say, I really am concerned that on a number of, of um, applications that I have seen here over the years, that um, we worry about obscuring windows. Now, I, there was one application somewhere else where it was affordable housing, where in order to protect the um, views of the non-affordable houses that already existed, the affordable houses had to have obscured glass in their windows, and I thought that was wicked, improper, and socially very divisive. So I just, and I, I want all developers and everybody to hear this, I think there's a real problem. If you live in a town, we, and if you live in a village, people see each other across the road. People see windows. They're not. If you don't like it, you put the net curtains up. I really don't think we should force people to have obscured glass. Um, but we have the application before us. If it's there, that's fine. But I, I, I think it's something we perhaps, for the future, ought to be mindful of. Thank you. I do actually see Mr. Cravers, so I'm just going to take his um, point, if that's all right, and then I will go to. Um, Mr. Kinsella. Thank you, um, Chair. Generally, excellent, excellent debate. Two great speakers. I agree with. Um, I, I hear exactly what Mr. King's saying. Um, I understand. Um, my colleague here, my colleague there says, and I'm, I am in dilemma. I would, well, I would say, with regard to, I find myself also agreeing with um, Christine over there as well. And what I would say is, I think the op this, yeah, you look at this from, look at this on Google Earth. You go and have a look at it. This site screamed to be affordable housing. 
But that's not a decision for this planning committee. That was a de decision for Devon County Council when they sold the site, or whoever did sell the site. You know, this, um, and we all know how difficult it is to find land for wholly affordable housing all, all through Somerset. And this is a site that was obviously sold to the highest bidder with no concern. And I think that's a shame. Um, and I'm not being political. I'm just saying it's a sad fact of life. There's very few sites out there. Um, what I would say is I understand what we're saying about the viability assessment, but then at the same time it's from Mike there, but at the same time it's the professionals that have done it. And as I say, statistics, housing needs surveys and viability assessments, I can never quite understand any of them, especially housing needs surveys. I'm still undecided on this. Um, I'm edging towards approval rather than deferring. I can understand why I think we're looking at the application that's in front of us. And I think for me, that's probably what's swaying it. There's an opportunity to get three affordable housing. And as Francis said as well, um, single people die need for social housing for single people. Thank you. Mr Kinsella, a number of points there for you to look at. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to defer to uh, Mr Jones about the viability because he knows the, the details greater than my, myself. What, what I would say about viability surveys is we all need to bear in mind that they're only ever a snapshot in time. So even if you did one today, come next week, they're probably going to be an element of them being out of date. So you're never going to be able to have a completely robust set of, of, of figures. And we have to use the, the data that we have as, as best as, as we can. I think just in terms of the conditions and, and some of the uh, confusion there, there is, I think the report and I think um, Mr. Jones' presentation clarifies the materials that are um, that are being proposed and that have been agreed with the, the applicant. And, and actually, if members um, come to the view that they're minded to, to approve, I want to return to conditions for the vote anyway. So I'll, I'll touch on that in, uh, in um, <coughs> a later date. Um, but as I said, I'll, I'll pass over to uh, Mr Jones to talk about the, the viability side. Thank you. So with the application, we submitted the, um, the applicant's viability study um, of the proposal. So the proposal was initially two affordable housing units and seven principal residents. So what the what planning uh, policy uh, and case law um, has established that there's a figure of, of, of a reasonable profit that can be made of, of 20% on, on your outlays. Uh, I don't want to start getting into figures because as we saw, and as Mr. Kinsella has mentioned, um, they will change and it's a snapshot in time and, and some figures have been mentioned um, and these were assessed at their time and but everything shifts um, so if I start getting into figures I, I, I think it will start getting really complicated um, so um, the the assessment was the study of the outcome was presented to us and we asked uh, an independent um, viability assessment specialist to, to look at this and they looked they considered that um, the the profit that would be made on what was being proposed was less than 20 percent was acceptable um, I'll come back to this alternative in a second but on the basis that, that it had been suggested that there might be different layouts that might work we sat with the applicant and said well we think you could get more affordable housing on the site and they came back and said well we'll we're happy to have social rent which um, understand and a single um, bed social rent which uh, as officers we thought were, were, were really hitting that acute need and there's acute need across the board and an affordable rent so this took the profit down a little bit more um, so they are you know, the, the, the profit to be made on the basis of those figures and that assessment is, is considerably below what would be reasonable so the scheme as it is as officers we felt was acceptable so then going back to the, 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 the independent consultant looked at are there other schemes that can be done here and they suggested uh, that it could be possible to have smaller units across the board and more affordable housing could be um, delivered. Um, that isn't the scheme that's being put forward and, and off the back of that, that formed part of our discussion with the, the applicant, as, as I said, to, to negotiate more affordable housing. Um, and the cl conclusion was that it was a fair and reasonable outcome for the site considering all, all, all the costs. Um, 
and I would add, again, I don't want to get into to figures because we can debate how much a house is worth and what bill costs are. But I personally did a, you know, a sense check of how much the, the, how much it cost to buy the site and how much you could sell a three-bedroom house for. And it seemed to me quite clear that anything more than three affordable, it was questionable whether that would be viable, was, was my view, taking a, a sense check, albeit that isn't a professional um, detailed viability assessment that looks at every single cost in, in minute detail. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Mr. Elson. Thank you. Very quickly. First of all, thanks for the very clear presentation. It was really helpful to have these very high quality drawings and photographs and views that really helped uh, bring this to life and help us understand actually how this looks and where it goes. And particularly important, I think, for this development, which is a really interesting case. Uh, and I agree with a lot of the points that have been made. Um, as we know, building, building new houses for open market, although that increases supply, doesn't automatically generate then into a situation where prices fall because we have so much more supply that therefore we solve our housing need that way by bringing prices down. And of course, by doing so, you also upset the viability assessment as well, Britt making Dean's point clear that, that of course, um, these things were only ever snapshot in time. Um, but, but equally, not building any houses clearly also doesn't solve the problem either. Um, so that's why I think this, this scheme is, is really interesting and really a sort of a valid way through it. Um, uh, I uh, it might seem a small point really, but it's a climate change point in a way, which is about the parking, which has been raised about the two parking spaces per property. Uh, it seems to me a dangerous precedent to go down that we automatically assume that every property requires two vehicles to be attached to it. Um, and how that's going to happen in future if that continues, um, which may not be sustainable. I don't know whether there's any plan in here for electric vehicle charging points as to be already included in the scheme within the parking areas. Um, and also, uh, I would suggest that you might be better off having fewer parking spaces and actually allocate some of that space to storage because for these small properties, um, like the small flats, the issue about a small flat is storage. Um, and so now I, what I understand is that on some new developments, what they're trying to do is to create flexible storage units in lieu of parking spaces, maybe you know, one or two spaces, um, so that people in those flats, their spaces are a little bit be better because they have more space. So everyone's shaking their head. So clearly, I'm not, I, as you all know, I, am, I don't sit in these planning meetings as you all do on your respective councils. I come here as a naive bystander, but those are my points to make. Thank you. Come here as an informed member of the committee, Mr. Elsie. <laughs> Um, right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we have to consider the proposal before us and the officers have made it clear that they consider this proposal acceptable at the mix of six principal residents and three affordable. Um, Mr. Lay. I, on the back of what the officer's explanation was regarding the viability assessments, uh, obviously as it's no, we don't actually get to see them. We have to take their word for that, which is fine. And the point being that if we get to an, a situation of um, an appeal on a site like that, and that it, it, that independent viability assessment, it's what I've seen in the past has always been the central point for determination. On the back of what we've been told, I'll move approval in line with officer re recommendation. Thank you very much. Is that seconded by Mr. Yabsley? Right, thank you. Um, you wanted Mr. Kinsella to say a word about conditions if we were likely to move to approval. So before we put it to the vote, could you just tell us what the conditions might be should it be approved? Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to suggest that um, in, in light of some of the, the changes that I think we might need to make to the conditions, that the recommendation changes very slightly, that, that it's still planning permission to be granted, um, but that the authority or that members defer or delegate authority, uh, authority to officers uh, to finalise the wording of the conditions. Now, what I will do is I will go through those conditions with you now as, as what they, in essence, are going to say, but then the final details of that will be for officers to, uh, to, to complete, because I think there's a few changes that we'll probably look to make. Um, and there's, there's obviously also 
the um, section 106 that we'll have to finalise and um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and arrange. So just to very quickly go through the list, there are the standard conditions in terms of the um, time limit, three years, and um, the in accordance with the approved plans. There is the removal of um, permitted development rights on those units where it is applicable to do so. Um, there is the condition related to the principal units of accommodation, the principal residence, that they are achieved for the planning condition, um, that no external lighting is, um, uh, sorry, there's no, there's no uh, external lighting beyond what's already been approved without prior consent uh, of the, the planning authority that uh, there is the contaminated land condition that is currently on the, the list, as is the asbestos materials condition that is already uh, in the report. And then there is the construction environmental management plan condition, detailing matters around um, compounds and um, sort of control of, of dust and earthworks, for example. Um, condition uh, controlling the hours of construction during the construction phase. There is then need for a uh, condition to ensure that all of the recommendations, mitigations and compensation measures that are set out in the ecology report, that includes a reptile survey, an ecological appraisal and an ecological scoping assessment and bat emergence surveys, are um, that the development is carried out in strict accordance with, with all of those recommendations. Um, there may well also need to be a separate condition to ensure that we get uh, appropriate details of some of those mitigations. So some of the mitigations talks about needing bat boxes or um, things of a like, and, and it may be the officer decide that that needs to be a separate condition, so it, it might be one or, or two. Um, in terms of materials, um, it's been agreed that windows and doors will be timber, so there will be conditions to do with that that the guttering and the down pipes will be um, black powder coated metal and that the, the roof shall be clad in or the roof shall be clad in natural slate so they are all retained. Um, and then um, there is reference within the application to um, the use of air source heat pumps and the proposal also includes solar panels. Now, the solar panels themselves uh, are dealt with through the accord with plans condition because they form part of the drawings, uh, but the, the plans don't in any detail set out the location uh, or number of air source heat pumps. So we've got a condition uh, that requests prior to the installation, the siting and appearance of those to ensure that they're not uh, detrimental to, uh, to residential amenity. Um, there is also uh, a need for a condition to protect uh, existing hedgerows within the site um, and there is also um, it's felt necessary that an obscure glazed condition is is imposed um, there is uh, on the first floor uh, of the properties that face onto the residential properties it's, it's actually serving an ensuite so it's a bathroom so you would expect it to be obscure glazed anyway but just in terms of protecting the, the the, the privacy of the people behind that it's felt necessary and it's also probably necessary to restrict the opening of that window as well just to ensure that people uh, don't open it again views views in and out uh, and then just to pick up on a, a point that was raised earlier uh, I think it's also uh, relevant to seek electric vehicle charging points so that can be part of a, a, a condition as well um, but that they're the conditions the informatives are, are set out in the in the report uh, but I thought it was sensible to, to raise those, but the final wording to be left to, to officers. Thank you. Right, Mr Lay and Mr Yabsley, are you happy that um, as part of your approval that should include that members delegate authority to officers to finalise the conditions in line with those uh, outlined by the planning officer? Okay, so you're happy for that to be included within your recommendation for approval? Right, if this, Mrs. Nicholson. I to ask one question about the ob obscured windows. Are they only to be in bathrooms or lavatories? Yes, it will, it will only refer to, actually you can see it on the elevation on the, the, the screen there. So on the um, 
say for west elevation, the very top windows it would relate to, and that's what serves the ensuite. So it would only be that that those windows. We potentially actually thinking about it a bit more. It may only relate to to a couple of those units as well. But again, to have the flexibility just to assess whether they're needed across the board. As I said, because they're on suite, I fully expect them to be obscure anyway. But I think it's reasonable for us to have that control. Right. If there's no further debate, ladies and gentlemen, I will now put the um, motion to approve to the vote. May I see all those in favour of approval, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and those against two and those abstaining two right thank you that was an interesting debate that stands approved um, but with the delegation to officers to agree the conditions right thank you very much we will now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is 635 uh, which is land adjoining the B3224 at Treebrook Common. Uh, and this application is going to be presented again by Mr. Jones. Thank you, Chair, members. So, <laughs> members will record presented this at the, the previous committee uh, has been a site visit. Just wanted to highlight um, some amendments that have been made to the report. Um, critical one, uh, I'll come to this in a, in a moment, the detail of it, um, enforcement action is not being proposed. Um, I wanted to clarify reference in the report to heritage assets. Um, members will be familiar with the, the the, the, the term that's used in policy CED3, it's also used in the national policy, um, national planning policy framework. It's a generic term that refers to sort of all heritage. Um, so it's not just listed buildings, scheduled ancient monument, conservation area. In this instance, it is the historic landscape that I'm referring to as the, as the heritage asset. Uh, the report clarifies that the, the, the drawings that are um, for which approval is sought. I'll come to that in a second. And the report also clarifies that the comments of the Heritage and Landscape Officer uh, at pages 2, 3, and 9. I'll, I'll just um, highlight them in a second. Um, also, members will note from the site visit that the wood, as it is, and there's some photographs in there, it isn't in the position that it would be um, if planning permission were approved and implemented as proposed. Um, and I also want to clarify the policy reasons for refusal. So that, we're familiar where the site is from the previous presentation. That's the site plan. It was amended during the, the, the process of dealing with application. Proposed layout and landscaping. And this gives a, an impression of the, the, the fencing and the um, uh, elevations. This is photographs from the site visit. Looking very neat. So, so page two, the, the landscape officers' uh, comments are um, they have been revised, and I just wanted to, to point out that the landscape officer view was the revised proposal would cause less harm to the landscape than the original application, while it would still introduce a feature that is odds with the open landscape of the common. The development in this location would still be isolated away from any buildings or farmstead it is associated with. And just to emphasise um, below that, the historic environment officer notes the revised proposal doesn't include the grading of the area and the creation of bands or banks. I mean, there's less likelihood of below ground archaeological impact and doesn't advise further archaeological work. The officer notes, however, that in historic landscape terms, this was once an open landscape part of Treeborough Common the creation of a small enclosure is not in keeping with the historic landscape in conflict with policy SES3. I'm just scanning down to... So the, the planning officer conclusions um, are the revised proposal would cause less harm 
Oh no, I'm sorry, that's the landscape officer repeating that. So just coming to the conclusion, um, as you'll see in the conclusion, it, um, it's noted that the main driver of policy SES3 is to require development to be near to existing built form to protect the landscape as well as ensure sustainable development. So as such, the massive landscape is another reason it's contrary, the, 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 the proposal is contrary to policy. So contrary to policy SES3, CES1 and CED1. So um, isolated location and some harm to landscape and historic landscape. Um, and then just above the informatives, there's three lines there referring to enforcement. Apologies, I meant to remove them from the revised report and neglected to do so. So they are deleted, starting with and that an enforcement notice and ending with a question use, full stop. I conclude. Thank you, Chair. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jones. We have one speaker who is Mr. Furs, the agent for the application. Uh, Mr. Furs, if you come to the table, just make sure that the microphone is on and you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, timber storage and the wood shipping operation is vital to this electricity generating business which can operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year using wood chips and other fuels. During the site visit you would have seen the large piles of wood chip which have been produced from hedge laying, op hedge -laying operations on nearby farms which would otherwise be burnt adding to Exmoor's carbon footprint. The local plan actually supports increasing the value of timber produced on the timber by making fuel and in this case it there is, would be a re reduction in transport distances. The development also provides employment and, co and contributes to the local economy making the CHP operation sustainable. There is no alternative site. It cannot take place on the CHP site which operates, operates under controls imposed by this authority because of the proximity of nearby houses and there is also insufficient space. The main thrust of policy SES3 is against the construction of new buildings in the countryside. No buildings are proposed as part of this development and as such it can be regarded as a soft change of use of existing business land. If the timber storage is no longer required it can simply be returned to its former condition as pointed out by the landscape officer in, in previous comments who described it as being reversible, even when there was far more engineering works involved. The reason for refusal refers to the material harm to the landscape character of its common and its historic value. This creates the impression that the, t that the timber would have a significant visual impact from miles around. But the landscape officer recognised that because of the back cloth, the stored timber will only be seen in proximity to the site, which is actually in the region of 160 metres from the adjacent bridleways and footpath. It must also be recognised that the applicant is quite happy to allow people to cross his, sap, his site. Also, a large portion of the common has a lawful equestrian use and, and, is part, and was actually partly funded by this authority. The approved course operating manual allows up to 20 riders every day from M March to November, uh, with possibly horse boxes parked here on the site. Um, and this proposal is just an alternative business use. It is asked that planning permission be granted as recommended by the Brompton Regis Parish Council and is accepted that there will be conditions impro imp imposed controlling its use. Can I also say, you've still, the plans are still wrong, which is, I think is going to add to confusion. Right, thank you. Um, for Sorry about that. No, uh, thank you very much for pointing That's that out, Mr. Fares. Yes, thank you. You did point that out at the site visit, and I'm just referred to the site visit notes now. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you will have seen uh, tabled the notes of the site visit. Will they re to you in advance? So um, you will. Some of us have them tabled, some of us uh, had them by email. Um, very interesting site visit. Uh, one of the points that was made at the site visit was the plan, and I just wonder if you could refer to that, Mr Kinsella, so that we're absolutely clear about what the plan is. 
Yes, apologies, Member, for that. But basically, in terms of the um, accurate plan, it's on the screen before you now. That is the plan that you're being asked to, to consider, uh, which shows the timber storage area. And then the areas that are outlined in green show the areas where there is proposed planting, tree planting, um, that we were advised when, for those who attended the, the visit on, on Friday. Um, so it is this plan that we'll, we'll keep on the screen to ensure that it's very clear on what, what you're considering the application on. Right, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Nicholson was the first hand out on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, it was a it was a very um, a very helpful site visit, visit, and um, thank you very much for a, 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 for the report and the, and the clear presentation. Um, the listing of the questions and the policies I thought was was, was really helpful to thinking. Um, but in addition to that, I went back and read the original applications when the combined heat and power, or power and heat or whatever it is, um, plant w um, was established, the various decisions and and, um, uh, and and appeals and comments that have been made. Um, looking very carefully at the policies and looking at, uh, thinking in terms of the site visit, um, the, there are three questions. Um, farm diversification, landscape, um, these are the three, I mean there are lots, but the salient questions are farm diversification, landscape and business in, 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 in open country. Um, it's clear that it's been accepted from the beginning, from the earliest application, that, that the, the plant itself that is to be fed um, is um, an acceptable form of um, farm diversification. And um, just at that point, I'd also say that in that officer report, it, it, it talked about um, that uh, using local uh, sources of timber would reduce the na need for travel for uh, timber to come, uh, not that it, there would be no need for timber to be brought in. So that was just one thing. Um, it, I also noted, very interestingly, that from the, um, uh, the appeal decision, that, that um, a combined heat and power plant is not considered to be industrial. Now, that, that, so that's sort of um, almost neither here nor there, but that's an interesting point. Um, landscape is really, really important. It's what we're charged with conserving, among other things. It, is, it reminded me going there on Friday just what a splendid landscape it is. The great big sweeping views from the distance, that's its, 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 its real value is the distance, distance of the views and the... Um, that you can see from all over this great long, big high common up against the road and set of trees on either side of the road and going into more wooded country. Um, I don't think, looking from any distance at all, that it will be noticeable that there are some that's planting around a wood store. One thing I would say is that line of trees is in, that suggested in, is on that plan along the side of a, of, 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 of a right of way is inappropriate and should be removed from the, uh, from the application. Should it be passed, I would want to either be struck out or a condition to say that shouldn't happen. Um, yes, of course, um, the roadside hedge will be, uh, will be um, coppiced at times or rather laid at times. Uh, there is planting inside that, between there and the wood store. There are lots of wood stores, piles of wood all over the moor. I mean, I, could, I can think of a, num you know, a dozen or more as, as, I, I, as I sit here. Um, I think uh, a planting of trees right against the edge of this wonderful landscape, I don't think will diminish it. I think it will just show a working landscape, which is also what we are showing and what we are conserving. So I, I don't believe that landscape is a sufficient reason to turn this down. We then, I think, must come to um, the, the policy SES3, so getting rid of landscape and seascape character and getting rid of, of heri conserving heritage assets because it is a heritage asset, that, without, without any doubt whatsoever. 
but turning to SES 3, and um, it is particularly um, Section 5 of it which is, is quoted as why this should be turned down. Now, we've, we have learned, we have been taught that we must be very careful about the wording of our policies. And I want to go through the, the, uh, the, 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 the sections that we have here. First section, business development will be permitted for the change of use and conversion of existing traditional building, but it's not a building, so that one won't work. Policies for extensions to existing business sites or buildings that are well related will be permitted, dot, 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 for the rest of it. Yep, that, covered, that, that is there. Proposals for extensions to existing businesses or sites that are well related will be permitted. It doesn't say anywhere what won't be permitted, it just particularly encourages that. Um, and then we go on to three. Additionally, proposals for the diversification of the existing agricultural or other primary businesses responsible for land management um, through the reuse, re-change, uh, reuse or change of use of an existing non-traditional building, it's, there's no building proposed. So that one doesn't apply. The erection of new business premises in open countryside that one doesn't apply because it's not erecting anything. Um, and it then goes on to enable the building to be used for, a condition will be attached to the permission to enable the building. Well, there isn't a building. Um, and then, uh, hang on, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing all right, but I'll be quick. Business use in buildings which stand alone or, well, it's not a building. And then we get to six, um, we've got uh, permitted development rights being removed, which is neither here nor there, uh, because that's not where, where we are. So, using our own policies, our policies are silent on this. On that basis, I propose that this should be approved. Is that seconded? Mr Thwaites, do you wish to speak to that? Only that uh, I find myself in agreement with Francis here. I did go to the site meeting. <laughs> I did go to the site meeting and um, exactly the same view is the trees up there are really not necessary. Um, you only have to go a little further away from the actual site itself and you don't see the uh, timber because of the curvature of the land. So I don't personally think that uh, it distracts from the historic landscape. In fact, I think we would be hard pushed to come along and say that's the case. Um, and also, of course, we do need to encourage businesses. Um, it can't be stored where the actual chipper, uh, the actual um, generating equipment is. So I think this is the best approach we can get. I think it's very sensible. Um, Irrespect of the policies, I just think it's a very acceptable approach and we need to encourage businesses. So I don't think it detracts from the historic landscape. In fact, if anything, it enhances it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thwaites, but we can never be irrespective of the policies. Um, but anyway, thank yeah, so I think you. I second it as well. You did, yes, you did. Thank you. Dr. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm picking up the mood of the meeting here. I did go on the site inspection. It was extremely useful. Uh, in this case, I mean, it's been recognised in terms of landscape appraisal that uh, prominent storage areas are a force for change. Uh, I think that's in a negative sense. But I also noticed that we have got wood piles elsewhere in the vicinity of the site. It's all part of the, the management of the land. So it's not necessarily out of place. I personally wasn't convinced about the reasoning why it should not be sited nearer the existing buildings. Uh, I did hear what was said about that, and presumably the concerns about the issue of a noise abatement notice, for example, but we, we're not at that situation at all. But nonetheless, uh, the application site is where the application site is. Uh, so we've got to consider the scheme before us, as with the last application. The site visit was extremely useful, and I think providing, and I agree with what's been said, uh, I think providing it is tied to the description of the application, which by its very nature secures it as a temporary use. It's not going to be there as a long-standing commercial use once the CHP operation ceases. And I'm not saying that it should do, of course. Uh, we hope it succeeds. 
Uh, but I think subject to it being tied to that existing operation, then in terms of the landscape impact and obvious um, otherwise conflict with policy, we do have to be careful with policy, as we said, and also the planning history of this site, which has included a refusal quite recently. But I think subject to those considerations, I would not be uh, averse to the uh, recommendation of approval. I would support it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. Mr. Yabsley. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Chairman. And just uh, to support colleagues who have just been speaking, also I was on the site visit, uh, and what's planned in front of us moves the timber stacks down in a more, in a more uh, organized and close to the hedge site where they would be less visible. Uh, uh, and it, it, we are supporting di diversification. I also uh, think that the trees proposed for planting on the top side uh, are inappropriate. And I think they'd be better off not being done. I will be supporting my colleagues on this one. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Lay. Um, yeah, as someone who did not attend this site visit, and I'm guessing that could be the majority, I'm not sure, but suppose it is, um, one point's been raised I find interesting. One was France's interpretation of policy. Yeah. So I'd be interested to know Dean's response to her interpretation of the policy from an officer's perspective. Right, um, Mrs. Lawrence. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm sorry I didn't go to the site visit. It w I was already <coughs> got something booked up. Um, but I am very, very, very keen to support this. I think farm diversification has come a long way from jam making and bed and breakfast and all that. That's been around for a long time and I'm really delighted when farmers go out of their way to find a way to survive and I give my you know I think it's great it's not perfect nothing is perfect but I think it's a landscape that can be molded it won't notice a lot whether you put trees I don't whether you put trees in or don't have trees I don't mind too much whatever but I do think um, it is not so very different to some of the changes in the past, which we now gladly accept. This is not a building. This is nothing that's going to be in your face. So I'm very happy to support this. Thank you. Does any other member have any immediate comment before I ask the planning officer to comment? The chairman. Yeah, just a couple of comments listening to the debate, really. And uh, this is quite an interesting one, isn't it, really? Because quite a lot of reference within what I see on the notes, as was mentioned earlier, to buildings, and yet I can't actually see one on the application anywhere. I think we would have to be reasonably careful in proving that, uh, that the appropriate conditions were in place, and I would like to see it conditioned that it should only be used for, for storage, um, that there should be no storage of the associated machinery and equipment there, and that it is only for use of the storage of materials. Um, uh, and, and that should its use cease, that it be returned to its original use within a very short time. And I would also tend to agree, I think tree planting in a good many cases actually draws attention to this rather than allows, allows it to remain a temporary, a temporary situation and, uh, and, and can, can sometimes increase its landscape impact just by virtue of the fact there's something new in the landscape that wasn't there before in the way of trees that will be there for opportunity. Thank you. Right, thank you. Mr. Kinsella. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess what I, I want to focus a little bit on is the uh, interpretation of the, the policy. Um, I mean, we have had a similar application where I think same, the, the, the same matters were raised in terms of the word in the policy doesn't make reference um, what well, makes reference, sorry, to, to, to buildings, um, and, and doesn't make reference to um, to the use of land. I have to say, I think members are misdirecting themselves in the interpretation of the policy. Um, I think when you look at the the policy itself, it talks about the title, talks about business development. Now, development in the planning system doesn't just involve structures, but it actually involves the use of land, 
and so therefore that is a clear indication in planning terms that it is more than, than just buildings. It is unfortunate that the exact wordings do talk about buildings, but if you take that further in terms of what the policy would therefore mean, you would see significant changes to, to landscape character um, across the authority. Um, I'm, um, I noted that there was some references to the schemes being not perfect. Um, I would go further and I would argue potentially this is contrary to your own local plan. Um, so therefore, while I certainly don't do it lightly, um, on this instance, I am going to request that the Chair cease proceedings as set out in the Code of Conduct um, under Section 9, where the Chief Executive or their representatives at an authority committee may stop proceedings and request the opportunity to report further on the application to the next meeting of the authority. And I do put that request because I would like to report further. Thank you, Chair. Right. In the circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, I think that that is probably the best course that we can follow on this particular occasion. So effectively, the item will stand deferred until uh, the next meeting. Um, I don't know if we formally have to vote on that or we just do it. I think it's a request. Sorry, members. Um, it's a request uh, that the officer can make. Um, within the Code of Conduct, it's a, a request that members have to accede to, um, and that's also backed up in the um, uh, uh, standards uh, that is... I've, you haven't got it here, yeah. have you? Uh, so it's, it's backed up there as well. Paragraph 25, if that's the... Um, right, so we'll take it then that it's actually accounted for within the Code of Conduct, and therefore we don't need to vote on it. We just accept the fact that it will stand deferred until the next planning meeting. Um, but nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, it's an extremely interesting point, and one which it is worth us studying at length. And let's take this as an opportunity... Um, to be able to understand even more fully than we think we currently do um, aspects of the plan and treat it as a learning experience. So um, we will uh, leave that one at that point. Um, I am going to suggest that we actually adjourn now for five minutes and you can have a minor comfort stop, but it will be five minutes, so please be back here by the time that clock says 22. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll uh, kick off with item 13.3, 6211 an application under Regulation 3 of the Town and Country Planning Act for the proposed establishment of the England Coast Path uh, at Glenthorne, the Towers Road from County Gate to Wellfield, Brendan. And this is going to be presented by Yvonne Dale. Thanks, Chairman. Good afternoon, members. Item 13.3 of the agenda relates to land at Renthorn at Lydon's Brendan Parish. The application seeks permission to propose establishment as part of the England Coast Park. The application transport permission is forwarded to the three scheme of delegation as the authority are the applicants. Glenthorne Estate lies on the coast between Linton and Porlock and is accessed from the A39. The access down to the house is steep and windy and is from the A39. Glenthorne itself is a Grade 2 listed building with views across the Bristol Channel. The site lies within landscape character type B, high wooded coast coombs and cleaves, comprising of wooded coasted valleys and wooded cliffs. In 2017, Natural England set out a, a report including proposals for improved access to the coast between Minehead and Coombe Martin. The Marine and Coastal Access Act 2009 places a duty on Natural England to secure access by means of a route and an associated margin of open access land for the public to enjoy. The route through the National Park falls into one complete stretch of the England Coast Path, which is Minehead to Coombe Martin. The South West Coast Path already exists for much of this route uh, <clears throat> and where the, line is, where the line is proposed to become the England Coast Path as it meet, where it meets the criteria to become by the Marine and Coastal Access Act. Where it does not meet the criteria, a new route is proposed and the South West Coast Path will also follow this line.
this particular stretch of the southwest coast path did not meet the criteria under the Marine and Coastal Access Act, as the existing path is up to three quarters of a mile inland. The proposal consists of a new path that will be 830 metres in length and will be between 0.9 metres and 1.5 metres in width. Approximately 520 metres of this altered route will follow an existing disused path, but will need to be widened and levelled. The remaining 310 metres will be a new pathway created using the cut and fill method and will connect to the main access drive to Glenthorne. No additional surfacing material is required. The proposal also includes areas of regrading, such as banks and the rebuilding of stone walls. Excess material from the regrading will be used to regrade the existing and the proposed path. <coughs> the new path has been cited to align with the contours of the land where possible and to avoid the mature trees. The proposal is considered that the proposal would not have a detrimental impact on the landscape. It is sensitive to sensitively sited and uses site sensitive materials, it has an exceptional impact on the character and appearance of the landscape and the heritage coast. The officer's report outlines the main planning considerations and it is considered that the impact on protected species and habitats, the historic environment and public rights of way are acceptable and where necessary through the use of conditions to make those acceptable. The application is therefore recommended for approval subject to conditions set out on pages 9 to 11 of the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Ellicott. Well, I propose that we accept the officer's recommendation and approve this application. Having walked that stretch of the coastal path, it was in need of a lot of work. There were several places where it was quite dangerous, and this can only be an improvement for the access of people doing that particular stretch from Linton to Porlock or vice versa. And it does carry a lot of people. A lot of people walk that particular route. Thank you. Thank you. Dr Kelly? I agree with uh, Mr Ellicott. I second the approval. Thank you. Is there any debate? In that case, may I see all those in favour? Uh, Snem Com, thank you very much. So we move on to the next one, which is 13.4, and this is application 6241-22023, picnic site and car park at the Valley of Rocks, and this again is going to be uh, dealt with by Ms Dale. Thank you, Chairman. Item 13.4 of the agenda relates to the picnic site and car park at the Valley of Rocks, Linton. The application seeks advertisement consent for the proposed installation of five signs. One entrance sign, one information board, one disabled parking sign and two payment information signs. The application comes for committee in accordance with the approved scheme of delegation as the authority are the applicant. Valley of Rocks lies to the northwest of Linton and is a well visited landscape that is significant for its rugged and scenic beauty. The site comprises of several important areas for landscape, ecology, and community reasons, including as an important recreational space, coastal triple SI, registered common land, picnic site and car park, and village green. The permitted use of the land is as a picnic site and does accommodate vehicle parking which supports its use as recreational space. The application seeks to erect five new signs. <coughs> so the welcome sign will be here. The information board is here. This is a disabled parking sign. And the two parking information signs, one's here and one's down here. Advert 1 is the freestanding information board <coughs> located on the northern side of the Public Conveniences Building. It is constructed of timber with a green overlay with white text, 1.2 metres at its highest part, and the board is 1.3 metres wide. 
Advert two, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Advert two is a freestanding is a freestanding entry sign located at the entrance to the car park, lying east of the entrance track. It's constructed of timber. It's approximately 1.3 metres high and 1.2 metres wide. <coughs> Advert three is a disabled parking sign located to the south of the public conveniences building in the first car parking area. It's a painted metal sign attached to a timber post. The sign is approximately 0.3 metres in height by 0.3 metres wide and is placed on a timber post that is approximately 0.6 metres high. Adverts 4 and 5 are freestanding parking payment information signs and both adverts are the same. They will be sited to the southwest edges of the site and adjacent to the parking payment machines. The replacement and relocation of the first parking payment machine and the introduction of the second payment machine were approved under application 624121. 019. Adverts 4 and 5 are constructed of green painted metal with green overlay with white text. The sign will be 1.7 metres high and 0.8 metres wide. This is an example, an image of the information board text. This is the image of the welcome sign, the disabled parking sign. And these are Advert 4 and 5 is the image for the payment information signs. This is the photograph of the existing welcome sign that will be replaced and the new sign will be put in the same location. The car park and picnic area just lies to the left hand side of the photo and the public conveniences building is just in, is just in front. The first parking payment information sign will go here. The second payment information sign is here. The information board lies here just to the right hand side of the public conveniences building. And the disabled parking sign will go here. The public conveniences building is just here to the right hand side. It is considered that the proposed signs would not cause harm to the character and appearance would not cause harm to the character and appearance of the landscape, the triple SI, the registered common land, the village green, the heritage coast, the public rights of way, or the important open space for recreation. The proposed signs would not cause harm to the amenities of the area or impact unacceptably on the public safety or highways. <coughs> The applications are therefore recommended for approval. Members may be aware, and it is noted in the officer's report, that at the time of writing the report and today's committee, that the consultation date has not yet expired. The application had to be re-advertised following a change to the proposed description. The consultation period expires on the 7th of July. Since the time of writing and today's meeting, the following replies have been received. There is one letter from Linton and Limmer Town Council who have raised no objection. And there is a letter of representation from a resident of Linton. The resident states that they believe the information board is vital, but has commented on the suggested location of the board. They have said, suggested that the area within and around the Bridleway Gate next to the cattle grid is more easily accessed by visitors and dog waters, walkers, as well as Valley Rocks car park visitors. There is also a further opportunity for a similar, if not identical, information board on the southwest coast path gated entrance to the North Walk. The applicant have been asked for their comments and have stated that while they have taken the opportunity to update the information board as part of the works to the upper car park, there may also be opportunities to look at information more widely in the valley to see if there is a need for additional carefully cited information as suggested. This would need to be discussed with the town council who own the site, although the applicant would be happy to be involved <coughs> if this is useful. The application is therefore recommended for approval subject to the approach that if any adverse comments are received between today's meeting and the 7th of July, the application will come back for committee for determination in August. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Petrinos. Thanks, Chairman. Well, I'm, I'm happy to move it, but um, I do have concerns more generally. This is not part of my motion, as my, my suggesting we uh, approve it. But I've noticed in the valley there has been an increase in the number of signs, some due to the fact that people, you know, are uh, unfortunately 
prone to in their life by jumping off cliffs there. And there's another one in the middle of the valley, they're on a post saying no stopping beyond this, um, beyond this point, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of unusual for that, for that particular setting. And the one sign that strikes me as standing out amongst all the ones that you just described is the disabled parking one, because it's bright blue. Um, and I just wonder whether there was another way of achieving the, right, the same aims, because often the, the, um, the disabled sign is on, is on the parking bay, or is on the ground, you know, so it's not quite so vivid and in your face, but happy to move it. Um, but I, hope, I hope officers take that into consideration. Mr. Adicott. I'm happy to second that, but I agree that the proliferation of signage is something that we want to uh, try to avoid if we can. I'd just like to thank the officer for the clarity of her, her, her presentation and, and to support this. I understand that we don't want clutter, but I don't see any of those signs as clutter. They're informative and will be welcomed by our visitors. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments, ladies and gentlemen? In that case, may I see all those in favour of approval? That is again NEMCON. Thank you very much. The next item, 13.5, is 6241 and this relates to the National Park Information Centre uh, at Lynmouth, and this is going to be presented by Mr Kinsella. Sorry, Chair, just moving around the furniture. Um, okay, so um, I'm actually presenting the next three applications, and I only raised that because they are all uh, related to the um, same um, proposal, but on three separate buildings. So it forms part of the Exmoor National Park um, centres um, in Lynmouth, Dunster, and Dulverton. Um, I will go through um, each in turn. Um, but uh, I, I thought it was just useful to understand a little bit in terms of the context. So this uh, follow it follows some funding being available to update the signage um, at our um, national park centres um, to ensure there is consistency in terms of branding and, and how they look um, and to use the opportunity to, um, to update our, our centres in terms of the external uh, appearance and the uh, um, the, the images and, and context within within the windows. So um, this first application relates to the information centre in Lynmouth and um, for those who uh, don't know it, um, I, I'm not sure there is anyone, but if there's not then the site is, is on the um, waterfront uh, in, in Lynmouth, uh, forms part of uh, the pavilions building uh, and this aerial image shows its, its general location. You can see the roundabout at the top corner, which leads to public car parking, um, and the main Lynmouth um, High Street is, is along here. Again, just to show the site in a bit of a wider context um, itself. Uh, and the next series of photographs just show the existing um, uh, sort of opening and, and elevations you can see the signage uh, used for real vinyl on, on the windows, and you can just see some of the signage at the top there sort of um, outlining the, the name of the building. You can also see the A-frame board that's put out on a daily basis and, and taken in at the end of the day for the um, cafe upstairs and, and other national park matters. Um, it shows the entrance to the, to the sites, but again just showing the, the existing vinyls uh, that are on the windows. And this just takes a, a broader um, view of, of the front of the building as it is today. The main entrance is here. That previous photograph actually was the side entrance. My, my apologies for that. Um, so here is the main entrance. You can see some of the existing um, advertising as, as you walk <laughs> into the centre itself. The steps here leading up to another entrance to the cafe, and there's also a sign on the side here for the cafe, which, which I'll be showing you shortly. So in terms of the proposal itself, um, this is uh, on the entrance uh, into the uh, centre, advertising the fact that there's a cafe upstairs and the National Park Centre downstairs. 
it's applied directly onto the wall um, and is done via a, like a stencil type application. Um, Looking at the main entrance itself, there'll be a replacement board that again will be um, placed outside uh, when the uh, National Park Centre is open, um, also advertising the cafe at the first floor. And again, you can see the use of vinyls um, on, the, on the windows. And this shows the other side of the entrance. You can see the replacement um, sort of a, a replacement of the A-board um, structure here. There is an existing window uh, with, um, there is a, a monitor, a 17 inch screen that will have various images, again, promoting the national park, uh, as well as um, information around sort of opening times and um, sort of other, other events um, and other matters that, that may need to be advertised from time to time. This uh, slide just shows the uh, vinyl that will be put onto the, the windows, again, will be consistent across the national park centres. Um, and also there is a proposal to replace uh, an existing information sign on, on Lynmouth with uh, a, a right angled sign uh, at the top here, which will be at the front centre uh, of, the, of the front, so um, sort of off, off here, just off, off shot, I think there's a better slide in a moment. Within the, um, the frontage, but inside of the building, there is also proposals to have sort of sign posts um, and uh, other forms of advertisement just to advertise up and coming events from time to time. Um, there is a the potential for these to change, but generally this is the, the overall context in which they will be um, produced. Yeah, um, there will be furniture that again will be used um, for images um, to to again advertise the, the, the National Park. This is the right angled sign that I referenced a moment ago. And this is the alternative entrance. Again, this is limited to um, window vinyls just uh, for information purposes. And then the steps leading up to the cafe, again, there will be a replacement of a, of a single boarding there just to um, uh, to ensure that the, the advertisement is, is advertising is consistent across across the shop front, there is also um, again a, uh, a, a stencil of, of the word the pavilion at the top of the steps, uh, close to the entrance of the cafe. And this slide just shows it in in the wider context of how it would how it would look um, in its entirety. So you can see from the officer report that uh, the application is recommended that investment consent is granted subject to conditions, um, and I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Kinsella. Mr Holton. Just one point, and apologies if I haven't noted it reading through, um, but I noticed from the pictures there's a proliferation of stairs. I'm just wondering whether there, there are any signs for... Uh, people with disabilities and access to the cafe. Based on the signage that has been put forward, then that there isn't at the moment. Um, I will take that away and have a chat with the relevant officer around that to, uh, to ensure that there is, um, there is clear directional signage, but that may well be within the, um, within the centre anyway and, and wouldn't therefore require any investment consent. Thwaites, is your hand up or just resting? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Nicholson. Not questioning it at all, but just I noticed from the photographs at the beginning there looks like quite a lot of corrosion on the, over the, do you see? Over the windows. And the next photograph shows it not only there but further, sorry, not next one, that one shows more two sets of it. So just whether that's, that was just an observation while we're here case anything needs looking at. Can I move approval? Sub yeah, sub subject to the um, note about disability access. Seconded by Mr. Petrinos. Does anybody else wish to speak? Draw attention to any other building defect. Uh, Mr. Ellicott. No
Okay. Uh, so if there's no further debate, ladies and gentlemen, it's been proposed by Mr. Holtum and seconded by Mr. Petrinos that we should accept this. May I see all those in favour? Thank you. <laughs> That's NEMCON. Thank you very much. The next application is 13.6. Uh, and this is 610-22111. Um, this is the Information Centre at Dunster Steep Dunster. Mr. Kinsella. Thank you, Chair. The details are, are largely the same, so I, I will try and be a bit um, shorter in my presentation this time. But um, it relates to the Information Centre in Dunster. Um, and in terms of its location, you can see it's off Dunster Steep um, with the public car park uh, to the east. The centre edged in, in red. Um, there is a pedestrian area directly outside of the, the centre with the road running alongside to the north. Aerial image of the site to provide a little bit more context with the surroundings. Some uh, existing photographs of the existing signage. So again, you can see the, the common themes of, of vinyl used on the windows um, and in this instance, there is a, a fascia sign um, that is to be replaced. The sign to the uh, the entrance, sorry, to the uh, centre is recessed uh, slightly, um, and again, you can see the the uh, assortment of advertisement uh, currently in place. So this just shows the relationship of the building with um, the adjacent highway into uh, into Dunster. And uh, this shows the proposed uh, changes. You, you probably can see that, um, that the changes are, are limited in terms of the replacement signage, in terms of its scale and size is, is largely the same. Um, the uh, vinyl changes to the window are to be in keeping with the wider project aspirations. And you can see in terms of the window displays, again, the use of, of things like um, uh, sort of finger signposts um, and furniture to sort of uh, offer a consistency across across the uh, National Park Centres. This is just again just to show some of the um, vinyl uh, images that will be, be used on the various windows. This is a, a, again just a, a bit of illustration. The uh, LED screen that is to be used, opening times and uh, opportunity for further uh, advertising uh, on the one side of the entrance uh, and again just a bit more of a clear image of, of some of the, um, some of the um, structures that will be used behind. Now I'm raising the fact in terms of the displays just to be very clear is the fact that anything within one metre uh, of the front of the, the elevation can be considered advertisement requiring advertisement consent. So um, some of the things that you can see here, um, we, we are saying that, that, that would require advertisement consent. So that's why I'm spending a bit of time just to, just to go over those. Again, Chair, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Ellicott. Well, I, I like the idea of this corporate uh, signage. It'll um, be good to see all the centres looking as close to identical and representative of our national park. And I move that we approve this particular one as well. And um, it would be nice to get it done before the conference in Dunster because then we will be a showpiece for our national park. Thank you. Mrs Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, Dunster Parish Council had a notification about this and they were delighted. It is a bit of a dark corner, it, it, you know, at certain times of the day. It is quite dark, so anything that brightens it up to attract people in would be good. Yes, they were very pleased indeed. They've already spent some of our allocation money from the District Council on benches around there that makes it just a bit more hospitable. So I think it will improve the area. Thank you. You're seconding the motion. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? No? 
Right, may I see all those in favour, please? Thank you. Nemcon. The next is 13.769.22104, and this relates to the National Park Information Centre at 4th Street, Dalverton. Mr Kinsella. Thank you, Chair. So, finally, uh, the National Park Centre in Dalverton. You can see here it's located off 4th Street. Uh, there is a pedestrian walkway leading back to a, a car park with eventual access towards Exmoor House. Um, in terms of uh, its location, it is within the uh, main um, sort of centre with um, other retail outlets uh, uh, surrounding the, the site itself. So just some existing images um, you can see here. Um, of the existing signage and the existing shop front. There is again use of some graphics within, within the window and you can see already that there has been use of, of sort of finger sign posts itself. Um, just to show it in a little bit more context with the surrounding buildings and area and the final one just as the clear of the frontage. Um, Dalverton is, is slightly uh, different to the other two centres because of, it's obviously shared with the um, Somerset County Public Library um, and so the signage needs to, to replicate that. So in terms of um, the proposed changes, um, I, I think um, in, in my view anyway it's a lot more of a simpler shop front. The use of graphics again helps to sort of tie it all in to the, to the other National Park centres. Um, and, and it'd be, I think it's probably branded a, a, a lot better. Um, in terms of the vinyls, very much again, just echoing what you've seen before. Um, and the fascia signage again, um, you can see here, is very much similar to what, what is there at the moment. Um, obviously, there, there may be some other changes in terms of the public library, just in terms of um, things going forward in terms of the new um, authority. Um, but they, they will consider the time. Again, the use of um, window displays to um, promote Exmoor and the use of LED screens um, uh, to, to, again, have consistency across the centres. Um, and that, that's the end mm -hmm. of the presentation, Chair. I'll take any questions. I will bludgeoned by <coughs> the succession of visitor centres. Mrs Nicholson. But also to ask, ask a question, is the uh, German, uh, the, whatever it was, PT German or whatever, lovely gold and um, black um, uh, signage still existing behind the, the, the R signage? Because it would be pity if that got removed. Mm, good question. I, I have no idea. I don't know. It, I mean, I was, I'd forgotten that we'd actually covered it up. It okay. was really rather splendid. I will. I'll make a note of it and ask. Mr. Yabsley is seconding that. Is there any debate, any reference to the local plan that anybody would like to make? <laughs> <laughs> Start <reading the> <laughs> <laughs> rather disappointing. Um, Right, if there's no further debate, may I see all those in favour? Again, NEMCON, thank you very much. So, we now come to application decisions delegated to the Chief Executive. Only two pages today. Um, is there any general comment you wish to make, Mr Kinsella, before we go through them? Thank you, Chair. No, not... Um not a great deal. Um, I was just going to um, highlight that in terms of the decisions, while, while there aren't um, many for, for this month, um, they're, they're all positive decisions, which is, which is always good to see. I would draw your attention to the item at the bottom of um, page two as it's listed on the agenda. So the proposed conversion of stables to one local needs affordable dwelling, which is which is really positive. We worked through the section 106 and and got that one through, which is um, which is a really good result. Um, but apart from that, I'm happy to, to try and answer any questions that members may have. Thank you. So is there anything on page one? 
Mr. Lay. Just a comment. The, the next to the bottom one is something we see on a fairly regular basis, but it, it emphasises the fact that on its own, an agricultural tie is pretty important, especially bearing in mind that the property in, it, in, in question would not be there in the first place if it wasn't the need for such a tie. It's only important if you, um, if you don't keep a check on it and you allow them to go by for the requisite number of years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are, we are trying and, and do try and monitor as, as best we can. Um, this particular case, um, actually, there was a, a previous application that, um, based on the information, we wasn't satisfied, so we refused that one. Um, and it actually went to appeal, and, and we won that appeal. Um, but since then, they have they've come in with with further information, which has satisfied us that they've they've, they've been in breach um, of the um, agricultural occupancy condition. So um, it is unfortunate. You're, you're right in terms of the original purpose of, of the of the dwelling being granted was to um, was for an agricultural purpose. Um, but we will we will try and do our best to uh, to monitor. Yeah, yeah, but my reason for highlighting it. I said the agricultural tie with those back up is fairly important. I was referring to a one or six agreement. Yes. We, we, we thought you were, Mr. Lay. <laughs> yes. Mrs. Nicholson. Question on uh, the third one from the bottom on page two. Um, Mr. Chairman, both you and I saw rather messy building sites and things going on at Hatscott uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and um, oh, just w w we've got the proposed construction of a residential dwelling, removal of a residential mobile home, parked retrospective, nothing about uh, local needs, affordable pr principal residence. Perhaps could, could, could we hear a bit more? Yeah, certainly. So um, there's, there's a, a fair bit of history with, with this site. So the applicants um, had a... A, a residential mobile home on the site that they managed to uh, secure a certificate of lawfulness for. Um, so they had established uh, an unrestricted uh, residential dwelling. Um, uh, but at the same time, they also had a timber constructed building on the site that they was using for uh, residential occupation. Mm. Um, and the part retrospective element was that they were in the process of extended that. Um, we were made aware of it, um, and that. Um, resulted in the, the applications for the certificate and for um, the retention of the, the, the timber um, dwelling. Um, as part of our negotiations, it was felt that actually in terms of the timber dwelling, there was some benefit in removing the mobile home. Um, and so therefore, we in essence did a swap where we agreed that they would remove the unsightly static caravan and that we would allow them to retain the... Um, the, the, the timber building because there was considered to be betterment associated with it because there wasn't the restrictions on the original mobile home it was unreasonable for us to then impose a restriction on the on the subsequent application so it is a little bit unfortunate but in terms of landscape i think there is betterment that has been achieved thank you very much Mr. Lay. just uh, someone just come to mind one the one dean referred to at the bottom of page two you know the conversion to a local needs dwelling if Dean remembers, at the Export meeting, which the gentleman on your left chaired what, a month ago now, uh, a local farmer brought it to your attention that he applied for a pre app to do the same as this, but was advised that it would only be supported for a holiday event. You said you were going to look into it, if you remember. A, do you remember, and B, what's the outcome? Uh, I, I do remember, I think at the time, I, I think I spoke to them after the uh, the event as well and sort of said if they wanted to come and speak to me, then, then they're free to do so and I'm, I'm happy to have a discussion. I wasn't completely sure of the background as to why they may have been given the advice that it was never going to happen, but there, there may have been some genuine reasons as to why in that particular instance it wasn't a matter that was going to be taken forward. Um, they, they haven't contacted me yet, but my door's always open to have a discussion with Right. Are there any other applications delegated that anybody wishes to refer to? No? 
In that case, ladies and gentlemen, I will say that site visits, should any be required, will be on Friday the 29th of July, should any be required. Hmm? I think we've done our bit with Trebra, Mr. Lay. Thank you. Um, and if there is nothing else, I will hand over to the chairman of the... Ah, Mr. Halton. Could we have an update, please, on the uh, Linton and Barnstable Railway application? Um, I don't think we can do that within this meeting. Can we have one in the members' forum? But uh, I'm sure that the officers have heard your request and will do their best to act upon it. All right, thank you. Uh, if there's nothing else uh, on the agenda, I'm going to hand now to the chairman of the authority to formally close the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Pugsley. Um, there have been no further business. I thank you all very much for your attendance and declare the meeting closed. Thank you.